We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's his name? Jameson. Jameson. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. But, and so you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 95. Oh, great. So Jolie, six, 12, 95, yes. Got it. Do you need to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland. One, two, three, four. Gemma. One, two, three. Spell G E M M. Super Mario Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So, like. What, what's a good Italian passport? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's um, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Yeah, I am my password. <laughs> Like, this is highly amusing, right? Make no doubt about it. But what's kind of interesting is the way the reporter sort of socially engineers the victims. So what I mean by that is she doesn't just go, hey, what's, what's your password? She's like, what kind of dog do you have? Where do you go to school? She shows an interest. She starts sort of grooming the victim so that they disclose little bits of information without really realising it, except the guy at the end. So, <laughs> look, security is an interesting thing. And I do a lot of, uh, a lot of talks about... Uh, what we don't like to call insecurity is cyber, but cyber is the thing that you hear a lot of. Cyber is this scary, scary concept. You can add cyber to just about anything, and it becomes more scary. I'm going to show you some examples of this. So we have a little bit of a joke about this in the industry, that once you cyber something up, it's sort of this, this little overused catchphrase. But interestingly, there, there is a lot of sort of really fundamentally bad security stuff happening on the internet. And I thought, what I might do before I come along today is I'll go and find some stuff just to illustrate how bad it is. So I went and grabbed a few things off the net. These are obviously credit cards. Where do you reckon I grab credit cards from? Like, how big a hacker have you got to be to get credit cards? Facebook, who would put anything like this on Facebook or Google or anything like that? But here's the reality. You can go to a Twitter account called Need a Debit Card and all it does is retweets people who tweet their debit cards. This is real, right? This is going to be the rest of your afternoon now. <laughs> and the nice thing is, they'll do stuff like, uh, hey, here's the back of it as well. Because then you've got the CVV, right? For the card not present purchases. You know when you go on the internet and it says what's your code? Often that's on the back. Uh, so that's handy, that makes life really easy. Huge amounts of entertainment there. And the thing is, like, this account tweets it, and normally, straight after that, people delete them. Because they suddenly go, oh shit, what have I done? <laughs> you know, all these people are suddenly saying, get your card off the internet. So the, the thing is, we do a lot of stupid things as individuals, and that's kind of part of the problem. I'll talk about some of them today. Part of the problem also is that when we look around us, we're seeing hackers everywhere. And you see this on the news the whole time. And this is sort of one area of technology that makes the mainstream news like just about nothing else. So last week, you might have seen news about Yahoo. Yahoo lost half a billion records. Half a billion usernames, passwords. Via a state-sponsored actor. Could be Russia, something like that. Broke in, stole the information, because usernames and passwords for an email account are actually really, really useful. You can see what everyone's talking about. So, obviously we have a problem here with hackers, but one of the things I find really interesting is when you look at the news and you look at the stories that are going around, things like Yahoo last week, you see this representation of what hackers are. And I, I want to try and 
show you what you normally see, and then we'll sort of break that apart and go, well, this is what hackers really are. So, if you have a look for hackers on the web, this is what you see. The Google Images search. You may notice some trends here. <laughs> so, what can, we, uh, what can we determine about hackers here? Hackers have hoodies. <laughs> uh, this. this is why not none of your hackers. Way too colourful. They're, uh, they're really into green screens. I don't know if you've noticed this. Don't have a green screen. There's something about binary as well, which is kind of odd because pretty much everything's binary anyway, but apparently hackers, uh, hackers love binary. Now, you see this imagery just about everywhere. Every time you see a news story, it gets kind of repetitive. But it's not just the media. I mean, the media represents this in this particular way. But the other thing is there are organisations selling security products. And the security industry is, is massive because everyone is so worried about the cyber things. So I want to give you an example of the way the media represents hackers, and then we're going to tear it apart. There's a little project, a little Indiegogo project, for a product called Cujo. And Cujo is security in a box. You get Cujo, you put it in your home, no more hackers. Sounds good, right? This is part of the video clip of the Indiegogo program for Cujo. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. Now, first of all, how do you know he's a hacker? Woody. <laughs> all right, very good. He also has a green screen. <laughs> and did you hear how scary the music was? It's like a current affair, right? <laughs> they are trying to scare people because if you scare them enough, they might buy your security things. However, I saw this recently and I went, this is kind of strange because I've got a bit of an idea about how hackers work and it's not normally like this. And I went sort of all CSI and enhanced part of the screen. All right, this is a corner. Now, here's what struck me. This is a browser and the guy is hacking in a browser and the Cujo security in a box product is being sold on the basis that a hacker with a hoodie with dark music is going to hack you in the web browser is not how it happens. So I wanted to figure it out and I've, I've worked out what this guy is doing. And I'm going to show you something here that will be awesome when you get back to the classroom. You show your kids this and they will go nuts. Here's what you do. There is a website called hackertyper.net. Alright, now this is where you go, hackertyper.net. And then what you do is you just start mashing the keyboard. <laughs> and you're hacking. This is exactly what Cujo uses in their video. <laughs> they, they didn't show one bit though. What you do, right, is while you're hacking away, there's a keyboard shortcut and you go, damn it, can't get in. <laughs> Try again. <sighs> right, one more go. We got this. We'll hack a bit more. Yes, we're in. Amazing. This is how people hack. This is not how people hack. This is how security vendors sell products to scare people about the fact that they're going to get hacked. So a lot of scary stuff you see in, in the press. Last year there was a pretty serious incident in the UK. They've got a big telco over there called TalkTalk. So think about like the British version of Telstra. And TalkTalk got hacked and TalkTalk were all up in the news. Very, very serious business. And uh, this detective came out with some attribution, so who he thought it was. He said, we reckon they're Russian Islamic cyber jihadis. <laughs> Which is like the scariest possible thing. <laughs> is anyone Russian actually? Oh, good. Um, so, I don't want to upset anyone. But it's, you know, all right, we, maybe it's the accent, we think of the sort of villain thing. They're kind of far enough away, Cold War, yada yada. Uh, cyber, we've got a bit of cyber here. Obviously people are worried about jihadis and all this sort of thing. So he's just basically pulled out all these terms to make it seem as scary as possible. Now, when they actually figured out who it was, it was none of these things. They arrested a 15-year-old kid in his bedroom in Northern Ireland. I mean, I assume he's in his bedroom because you're a 15-year-old kid, right? I mean, he's not going into his underground lair or whatever cyber jihadis do. 15-year-old kid, 16-year-old uh, kid as well. They picked up a 16-year-old. There was a really old guy they found as well. He was 20. <laughs> and this is what it frequently is. And towards the end of this talk, I'm going to show you exactly how they break into systems like this and how easy it can be. But 
you know, I found this kind of curious because obviously the, the story had lots of cyber and hoodies and all this sort of stuff and cyber jihadis. And then it turned out to be these kids. And when we look at how systems are getting broken into and who's doing it, it is often children. He's 19 now, but he was legally a child when he was part of this hacktivist collective known as LulzSec, particularly around 2011. If you think, you know, you've all probably heard anonymous, like the anonymous hackers. And we don't know who they are, just anyone jumps up and says, yeah, I break in, I'm anonymous. <laughs> and that's the attribution. He was part of LulzSec. He's uh, turning up at court here. Look at the expression on his mum's face. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't just him, it wasn't just Ryan, there was Jake Davies as well. Jake Davies was a bit younger, also turning up at court with his mum, because that's how he's going to get to court, he's a kid. <laughs> and this is what it often is, which is a far less scary image. But before they were discovered, there was all the bravado and threats and all the usual stuff that you read about in the news. It all sounded very scary, until you realise that they're teenagers. So this sort of thing happens a lot, and it's, it's just sort of worth keeping in mind how frequently we read about things in the news that sound like they're scary and sophisticated, and it is legally children or very young adults. I'd love to see stats on it, but they're almost always male. There's really, really few times where it's a female who's discovered, and they're almost always at their oldest in their late 20s. And that's the demographic of most of our hackers. All right, so let's uh, change pace. Look at something a bit different. Uh, passwords. Now, passwords is probably one of the most uh, common security constructs we all interact with. We all have heaps and heaps of passwords. We've all got accounts everywhere because you need an account to do just about anything anywhere these days. And we do a really, really bad job of passwords. I want to show you what I mean and then I'm going to show you how to do it properly. So, we'll do a little bit of password bingo here. And I'll ask you some questions. So, first of all, passwords. Length. What is the right length for a password? <laughs> now, this is a statistically correct answer <laughs> because this is what people do. Now, it is either eight or if the website will let you six, right? Because it's easy. So that's part of the problem. Everyone here has a problem. All right, part of the problem also is randomness. How do you choose a password? Dog, what's your dog's name? <laughs> <laughs> Your dog's name is not random. Probably not. <laughs> kind of interesting if it was. Your dog's name is no good. Your dog's birthday is no good. What your dog eats is no good. The only thing that your dog is any good for with passwords is if you let him walk over the keyboard to generate your password. <laughs> that is about as good as you're going to get with the dog. I think everyone has a bit of a sense of what true randomness means, and it's not going to look like it makes any sense. I'll give you some examples, sir. All right, so that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem here is uniqueness. Because even if you do the first two things and you have a great big long password and it's totally random, once you use it somewhere else, you've got a problem. <coughs> because what happens is the likes of this Yahoo thing where a website gets hacked, the passwords get taken, and then hackers go around and they go, I wonder if this works on the eBay account or the PayPal account or somewhere else. They take the passwords and they try them somewhere else. There's this term called credential stuffing where you'll get a data breach. They give an example, um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn had 180 million passwords leaked a few months ago. 180 million. They were stored in a very weak cryptographic fashion. More than 90% of them got cracked in a few days. So you've got 90% of 160 million passwords. And then attackers automate the process of taking the passwords and seeing which other sites they work with. And then they go through and they drain your PayPal account, or whatever it may be. And that happens because we don't have uniqueness. So people are really struggling with these three attributes. And what that then leads us to is this issue around memorability. Because the thing is, in order to remember the password, people compromise on the other three things. Because people think they need to remember the password, which is the problem. Who here actually has long, random, unique passwords that they remember? One guy. Now, I've seen you before, I think you're this guy just here, <laughs> right? Because that's the only way it's going to work. You cannot remember every one of your passwords that's long, unique and random. Now have a think about how many passwords you probably have, not just the ones that you think are really important, but the throwaway ones that you use because you wanted to leave a comment on the news site or something like that. It's probably not dozens, it's probably hundreds. If you think back, 
long enough. So we've got a huge number of these passwords. And really, the only way we can manage these passwords and keep them unique and long and random and all this sort of stuff is to use a password manager. Does anyone use a password manager? What do you use out of interest? One password? OK. One password. All right, so there's a few. This is not total news for everybody. So just so you all know, this is a password manager. This is one called One Password. I like this one. There are other ones such as LastPass. And the whole premise of a password manager is that you put all of your passwords in one place, which worries some people, but you put them all in one place and then you protect them with a master password. So the reason it's called One Password is that the one password you have is the master password. And that one has to be a really good one because if it's not, you might have a problem. It's so good I get it wrong. Now this is kind of crazy. <laughs> Too slow. Too slow. Crazy because I'm showing you my passwords. But this is a good example, right? So I have, in my particular password manager here, 517 logins. Now, okay, I am abnormal. <laughs> I admit to that. But when you actually think about how many places you have created passwords in the past, it's almost certainly going to be triple figures. Now, here's the thing. When I look at one of these and I pick something that's probably not particularly important to me anyway, and I look at what the password is, that is what a random password looks like. It's longer than that. There's ellipses after that. But I think we might be recording this, so I'm not going to show you what's in there. But you get the idea, right? This is what a random password should look like. So if you don't have a password manager already, seriously have a think about one password being my favourite. It works, well, the reason I like it, it works on my PC, it works on my iThings, it works on everything. And it all synchronises and it all keeps things nice and secure. If you don't do that, you are making compromises somewhere or other. And uh, compromises when it comes to security is not a real good thing. All right, so that's passwords. I want to show you something a little bit different. And it's good for an audience like this because we've all got a lot of these sort of things, right? Everyone's got iPhone. How many people here have got Windows phones? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd try. Hey. <laughs> now, having, like, I do a lot of Microsoft -y stuff. I have an Apple Watch and I have an iPad and an iPhone because they do good stuff. They're also really easy to hijack. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. Let me give you a little intro first. Uh, this is Betsy. And uh, Betsy's going to tell you a little bit about Wi-Fi security. There she goes. I found lots of just like numbers and like signs just all together, which really doesn't quite make sense. But then when you go get into it, you'll get it and it'll like, it'll come clear to you. Betsy set up her computer to pretend to be the Wi-Fi hotspot, as it were, in the cafe. So when uh, the victim connected, um, they actually connected to her computer, and it was that way that um, all of their data went through her computer, and she was able to see usernames and passwords and that kind of thing. Um, and it's known as a man-in-the-middle attack. All right, so the, the Betsy thing is interesting. Because on the one hand, it is very trivial to do, and we'll do this in a moment. On the other hand, I do feel it's a little bit, a little bit contrived. Uh, not so much because of the passwords and the Wi-Fi and everything, but she's sitting there drinking coffee, which struck me as unusual. Uh, she's, she's also using a tool called Wireshark, which is like a really full-on, low-level packet inspection that any technology professional looks at and goes, I got no idea. <laughs> like, this is confusing stuff. But anyway, so Betsy's hijacking Wi-Fi. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just turn a couple of things on here. We might, we might sort of see if we can do what Betsy's been doing. Uh, now out of curiosity, while this fires up, who here connects to public Wi-Fi? Uh, it's because it'd be easier to go the other way around, and then some people might lie and put their hand up. But the reality of it is, we all connect to public Wi-Fi because we need connectivity. And it's kind of crazy, because a lot of the time we have like 4G, we've got pretty good connection speeds in Australia, at least for our wireless um, um, cellular networks. But particularly if we travel, you know, you're in an airport, you want connection, you might want to go to a cafe and work for a bit, you want a connection. I want to show you how easy it is to hijack these connections. So part of the reason I've got so much stuff up here on the stage is I've got this little device here. Now, uh, as you can see, this is a pineapple. And this is what it's called. It's called a Wi-Fi pineapple. You buy this off the net for a couple of hundred bucks. And what it does is a few little neat Wi-Fi tricks. Now, you know how when you go home today, 
some sort of magic will happen and then you will be on the Wi-Fi. And then you go back to your office and there'll be more magic. And it's just like, how does this magic happen? It's not magic, it's science. And the way that science works is that our devices send what is called probe requests to known networks. So you know you connect to a network, a lot of devices will just auto-remember it, a lot of the i things will auto-remember it. Other times you tick the box and say, yes, remember this network. It works by your device sending out signals. For anyone turning off your Wi-Fi now, don't, because it's going to be much less interesting if you do. <laughs> all right, so here's what we'll do. This is the administration interface for the Wi-Fi pineapple. And what my little device here has been doing is it's been looking at your devices. So I can now go down to PineAP here, and what we're seeing over here is all of the network names that you guys have been broadcasting. We'll scroll in a little bit on that. So you may recognize some of these. <laughs> now, I'm going to turn a few things on while we're doing this, because this will make it all a lot more interesting. So as we spin through here, and we'll just take a little bit of an example here, we might see things like, someone's been connected to Travis Marshall's iPad. No, there might be a Travis Marshall here. There might, might be a Dr. Lou. Now, these are network names, right? So your devices have been looking for networks with these names because if it can see it, it wants to connect. It wants to do this sort of automagic thing. So this is quite interesting. And all I've done here with the configuration is I've just said, let's capture all of these SSIDs into the pool, but let's also broadcast them back out. So if you pull out your device and you have a look at your network names, you might see rather a lot of strange network names being broadcast. Right? Depending on your device. Different devices work in different ways. Now, what will happen is when these network names get rebroadcast, occasionally there'll be a device out there which sees the network name and says, hey, this is good. This is what I was looking for. I wanted this network. Let's connect to it. And here are the people that are connecting. So, for example, um, Paula. Paula? Yes, Paula. So Paula is uh, presently connected to my device. Uh, Dion? Dion's giant. Is there a giant one now? What have I been missing? <laughs> His badge even says it, Dion. So let's sort of walk through what this actually means. Dion is connected to my Wi-Fi pineapple. That means his traffic is going through there. That means I own his traffic, metaphorically. Now, what can I do with that? Uh, if the traffic is not encrypted, I can read any of the passwords that he sends, I can look at any of the information that comes back over the connection. If the, if the connection is connected, so you know you go to a website with a little HTTPS on the address bar, you get a little padlock, that's what we want. I can't do anything with that. What about, say, uh, if you go and read the local news, is that normally encrypted? Do you have an HTTPS? Do you have a padlock? If you go and read the Gold Coast Bulletin or something, you, you don't. Because they say, well, it's nothing sensitive, right? But if I control the traffic and I can get that request to the Gold Coast Bulletin and I can insert a little social login on it, so when it loads on Dion's iPad, it comes up and it says, you need to log into Facebook to read this. A lot of people will do that. A lot of people will put in their Facebook username and password, and now I have it. So what it actually means as an industry is we're sort of trying to move towards everything encrypted always because this sort of stuff happened. And a lot of this has happened since Edward Snowden, and we know the NSA is sticking their noses into everything, uh, and we realise that we have to better protect our networks. Just before I kill this, let's see if anyone else is connected, just for curiosity. Who else have we got here? And so here's one. So Dion actually thinks he is connected to MacBook Connors. So that's the SSID that you're seeing on your device. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, Paula thinks that she's connected to Yes Optus. Uh, there's Kate up here as well. Mrs. Harvey. Now, see, this is interesting. Because Mrs. Harvey has connected to Yay Free Wi-Fi. <laughs> I don't think Mrs. Harvey has seen Yay Free Wi-Fi before, because I set that up especially here on my machine. And this is a perfect example of people see a Wi-Fi network, and they literally go, yay, I'm, I'm into it. When I do this at a lot of tech conferences, I call the Wi-Fi network Free NSA Wi-Fi. Do you know how many people connect to Free NSA Wi-Fi? Because what do you reckon they see when they're looking at the names? Free. Free. Okay, last thing on this, and I'm going to connect this device so we don't upset anyone, because sometimes people don't like their devices being hijacked. <laughs> last thing on this is that if you are using free Wi-Fi, go and get a VPN. 
So this is a VPN. This is a product called Freedome. Uh, it's made by a Finnish company called F-Secure. I hit the big protection button in the middle and I get encryption from my device before it goes out over the air, all the way through the internet, all the way through to one of Freedome's exit nodes. So I get encryption through to their service in Melbourne and then it goes out over the internet. So I get protected from people like me, uh, rogue cafe hotspots, uh, dodgy ISPs, all this sort of thing. So VPNs are pretty good news. You definitely want to have one of those if you're travelling and connected to untrustworthy Wi-Fi. Okay, so, continuing the theme of let's just see how much we can scare everyone. Uh, what do you reckon this is? Now, yes, it is, is a beer, a little bit more information. Uh, this is actually a beer control system. So this is a system which controls beer. And what we're actually looking at is a control system that's publicly exposed over the internet. So here's the thing. Whether you're brewing beer or running a water filtration plant or a nuclear power plant, you have computers that run them. Because convenience, a lot of these computers face the internet and they're discoverable. So what we've done here is found a publicly facing brewery and you might notice right up the top left under those boxes is a really key couple of words here. Authentication disabled. This is a publicly facing query that anyone can log into and start pushing buttons and doing things. This one lets you rent bikes. Stony Brook University. Um, this is actually an interface which is then virtualized and available publicly. This one's a bus, looks like a German bus. There's, I think there's something wrong with the back wheel there, but that's a German bus. Uh, this is a taxi somewhere else, somewhere with Euros. I like this one, it's a super yacht. What do you reckon you'd do if you got access to the control system of Supio? Would you hit the recipe button or the engines? <laughs> you know? Alarms, we've got running lights, anchor lights. <laughs> I like this one, hydro massage. Publicly available, I'm going to show you how to find these in a moment. You could log on to here. And now I've not had a hydro massage before, but I assume that if you're in there, you don't want some hacker somewhere on the other side of the world putting the jets on, mucking around with it. <laughs> it doesn't seem very relaxing. Composter. That one's visible. We can see a whole bunch of output at it. There's an on and off switch. That's kind of handy. Now, obviously this one is a pool. What worries me is buttons to control chlorine and acid. Because I don't reckon you should expose those publicly with no authentication. But they do. Something else, I think there's some spinning blades or something there. You probably don't want anything with blades exposed to the internet. Uh, anything with fire as well. I think blades and fire, uh, blades, fire and acid are like three really good criteria. Lock your stuff down, don't do that. Uh, big fire, also lock the big fire down. <laughs> it's only 116 degrees, what could go wrong? More fire. What about this one? Does anyone know what this is? I'll give you a moment. Because this is a good, good little trivia thing. See if you can figure out what this thing is that you can control. It's a crematorium. Oh. With an infant button. Which is kind of sad and just scary that this stuff exists on the web. And is publicly facing. Let's see what we can find. So a lot of this stuff is discovered via a service called Shodan. Shodan is the search engine for the Internet of Things. You can find things related to security. You can find buildings that are connected. You can find, obviously, stuff on the web. Uh, webcams, we'll find some of those in a moment too. You can find a refrigerator. What do you reckon you do once you find a refrigerator on the web? Just like turn the light on and off, <laughs> tell me you need more eggs, I don't know. So Shodan has become really popular because what it does is it crawls around the entire web. It's continually crawling the web. That is not as hard as it sounds. It actually doesn't take that long to crawl the web and then look at all the ports that are open on each IP address. So consider an IP address like a home address, right? You go to the home address. This is how you find it. It's a published address. It's normally four digits, four sets of digits. It identifies every machine on the web. The port is almost like how many doors you have. So there's one door that's used for web servers. There's another door that's used for streaming media. So Shodan's continually going around there searching all this stuff, port scanning. 
And what you can do is you can do a Shodan image search. Now this isn't free, but it's about 49 bucks and you get lifetime access. And this image search is showing all of these machines that are connected to the web. Now all of these have RDP enabled, so remote desktop protocol. This is the way you would remotely administer a machine. But they all require logins, which is good. A lot of them probably shouldn't be exposed to the web anyway, because a lot of these logons are probably the same that they used in the Yahoo data breach or something like that. But here they are. Now, if we filter it down, and I've filtered this to port 5900, so this is like the door on that IP address, which is the port that's used by VNC, which is the Virtual Network Computing Protocol. So this is the way that, particularly in the past, we used to stand up remote desktop sessions. So if someone would go, let's run VNC on this server, or this desktop machine, and then we can be anywhere and connect into it. It's pretty convenient, right? And then as we scroll through, we'll start to see the things that are presently exposed. Now, some of these are just desktop wallpapers, some of them are command lines. But as we go through, we sort of start to see some stuff where you go, why is some of this there? What's, well, this has actually got an ad for a pizza. We can drill into these. And what it will actually tell us is that it's this IP address just here. Uh, this is in Mexico. So it's in Mexico. It's also running OpenSSH, if we scroll down a little bit. It's also running MySQL, which is a database server. Here's authentication disabled, and here's what it's currently showing. It'll take us about two minutes to connect into that and start pushing buttons, doing whatever we want to do. It gets worse. Webcams. And here's one of the problems. Port 554 is RTSP, the real-time streaming protocol. And RTSP is used by a lot of webcams to expose feeds publicly. Because what people do is they go, hey, I've got a good idea. Let's put a webcam in our house so that while we're away, we can see what's happening. It's, like, it's good theory, right? <laughs> the problem is, a lot of these devices are configured such that as soon as you plug them into your network, they open up a port in your router so that external connections can come in, which is kind of what they want to do, because they want to make it public. But they don't realize that a lot of the time these devices have either default credentials, username admin, password admin, uh, or they create weak passwords, or, as in these cases, they have no authentication whatsoever. <clears throat> so as we scroll down here, we're seeing real webcams all around the world in people's bedrooms, in their offices, car parks, and we can sort of go and pick any one of these. What are this guy's doing? Drill down into that, and this is going to be a static image hosted on Shodan. We can see that he's in India, and here he is, sitting there working away. He's got no idea the whole world's watching him, the whole world could be watching him. So it's, it's a little bit scary, really, just how much this stuff is exposed publicly and how easily accessible it is. If you have webcams or any of these sorts of things, really try not to expose them to the internet. If you are going to do it, point them at something that doesn't matter. Don't point it at your kid's bed. The kid will be fine. You don't need a webcam. Trust me. All right, so that's that one. Uh, let's try something different. Who here has used the dark web before? May I ask, what did you use the dark web for? Can you say? No, my, my son was showing me. Oh, someone else used it for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I was curious, it was this one time I was young. Uh. All right, so uh, you will often see in the news stories about the dark web, and the dark web sounds very scary. How do we know it's scary? Yeah. Good. Right, very good. We're learning. So, we see these stories about the dark web, and... According to the media, the dark web is where all the bad stuff happens. And make no doubt about it, a lot of bad stuff does happen on the dark web. But the dark web, really a, a sort of fair, fairer way to put it is the anonymous web. So people go to the anonymous web so that their identities are kept concealed. Now, yes, that is valuable if you are a drug dealer or you're selling weapons or stuff like that. It's also valuable for political dissidents, free speech proponents, uh, people who want to have private conversations. And when we talk about the dark web, we're normally talking about Tor. So you might have heard the word Tor. T-O-R, onion router. And Tor was actually created by the US Navy in the 90s to provide an anonymity network. 
And then, like, uh, like the internet itself, which came out of defense to begin with, it's become a mainstream service. I want to show you just how mainstream it is and how easily accessible the dark web is. So I went to one of the dark web marketplaces that's very popular called Alphabay. There's a couple of things here. First of all, the application I'm using here is the Tor browser. It looks just like a browser because it's based on Firefox. It's exactly the same as using a normal browser. It's a back button, there's an address bar. The address looks a little bit funny. We've got this funky sort of onion address up here. Because all these dark web websites have a dot onion address. But for the most part, it is just a normal browser. It takes you a couple of minutes to download, and then that's it. Now, when I connect to the dark web, I connect to another node somewhere. That node connects to another one. That node connects to another one. And my connection gets bounced around so that no one node can see both where you're coming from and where you're going to. And this is the anonymity component. Now that I'm down here in the dark web, you'll notice that this Alphabay site is pretty much just a marketplace. It looks like eBay. All right, it's got sort of some product categories over here, and granted, some of the product categories are different to eBay. <laughs> uh, but what I'm trying to get across here is just how mainstream and, and otherwise normal a dark web website is. If we drill down into something like drugs, this is a hell of a marketplace. There is a lot of stuff on here. And when we look around here, we can see all sorts of things that you've probably probably only heard of, uh, <laughs> and a bunch of things that I've never heard of. We can drill down further. So we might drill down, in this case, uh, into meth. Uh, there's a seller here. Uh, this guy is he's, he's a very convenient service. He ships Australia-wide. Um, <laughs> His name is Oz Connection. It's like an eBay seller, right? Oz Connection is a good bloke. He's got a good trust level. <laughs> because dark webs, more so than anything else, depend on reputation. Because there's no recourse. It's like you don't go to the ACCC and go, hey, I bought this meth the other day and it's crap. <laughs> you know, it's like, so they rely on the credibility that they establish over a period of time. And as we drill down into this guy, we can see that there's a lot of positive feedback. This is 99% positive. If you were going to buy meth, don't buy meth, there's a kid here, I'm aware of this. If you were, if you were going to buy meth, you'd go to someone with a really positive reputation. And that the story here is just, just how like weirdly mainstream this is. And even as we scroll down, it's a good bloke. Free postage as well when you buy your meth. What should really strike you here is just how normal this is and how easy it was to access. Now, a lot of people get caught doing this as well. So just in case you had just that moment, just that moment, <laughs> a lot of people get caught. Sites like this can go on for years before they're discovered because the site itself is on the dark web. It's hard to find. You may have heard of a site that was very big in the news two years ago called the Silk Road. The Silk Road ran for years. They turned tens of millions of dollars through this particular online drug market. Eventually they found it, shut it down, and the guy's in jail for the rest of his life. So it didn't work out so great for him. But this is the dark web, and the dark web is alarmingly easy to get to. Okay, let's go on to something else. And we know he's a hacker, first of all. I'll make that point in case it hasn't sunk in by now. I want to talk about one of the techniques that hackers use that is really, really effective, and then I want to show you how easy it is. So earlier on, we looked at Talk Talk. Uh, there was the kids, the 15-year-old, the 16-year-old, the old bloke, uh, and they had broken into Talk Talk. Now, they used an attack method called SQL injection. And SQL injection is considered the number one risk on the web today because it's enormously prevalent. It's very, very easy to find sites at risk. It's very easy to exploit, and it has a really high impact when you do. And the impact is you get all the data out of the system. Or you change the data, or you shut the system down. It gives you a high degree of control. Now, this is the only technical bit I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a brief explanation of how SQL injection works, and then we're going to do an attack. So, imagine you go to a website, looks something like this, all right, something.com, and then you get that little question mark. That's called a query string. So this normally has some parameters after it. ID equals one. Whatever this site has, you're probably going to get the record with ID number one. Now, there's normally some code that sits underneath that. And what the code will often do is it'll have a database statement. 
Okay, so a structured query language statement like this. Select star from widget, where widget ID equals, and it gets the one from the query string and it appends it so that we have a statement like this. And that gets sent to the database. Now, what happens next is some smart person comes along and says, what if we muck around with the query string? So what if instead of just ID equals one, I put a semicolon, that terminates the statement, and then I say drop table widget. That does pretty much what it sounds like it's going to do, because then you get a statement like this. And what that statement there is going to do is it's just going to drop the table out of the database. It's gone. There are other statements which will return all the usernames and passwords, return everything else. So it's an enormously powerful attack. You guys now know more about how SQL injection works than a lot of people who actually break into systems using SQL injection. And I want to show you how easy it is. So I got a volunteer. Can I have my volunteer, please? All right, come on up. Yay! <laughs> okay, now, there's Gemma. Gemma, and how old are you? Oh, good, so you're not yet an adult. You can't be tried as one for hacking, <laughs> which is, uh, that was really, thank you, Kathy, that was perfect. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get you to come over here to this website. Now, I'm going to stand away from the machine so it's clear that I, who can be tried as an adult, am not doing anything. <laughs> well, uh, Jenna actually goes through and does the hacking. Now, this website is one that I created specifically to train software developers about security vulnerabilities. So we can hack. It's okay. Don't worry. You're not going to get a job. <laughs> so what I'm going to get you to do is take the mouse and I'm going to get you to scroll down the page a little bit. And this is a website that lists supercars. And we can see there's a bunch of, uh, bunch of manufacturers here. We've got Nissans, McLarens, Paganis. Uh, so Jenna, just uh, choose the manufacturer that you like the most. And we'll, uh, we'll pick one here. Nissans, very good. Excellent. Okay, so what is happening now, it might be a little bit small for the people in the back, but in the URL, there is a query string. So I'm going to get you just to copy the entire URL onto the clipboard. And she is about halfway through having hacked the site now. You may not know this when you copy a URL. I'm going to get you now just to click on the little carrot icon down in the taskbar. Now that's off to the right a couple. That's the one, carrot. It's very uh, non-threatening, hacking the carrot program. <laughs> this is software called Havage. It's free online software. You can now, in that target box, replace what is in the target box with what you have on your clipboard. So you're just going to take that out and now we have that URL. We're getting close. <laughs> Let's click the Analyze button just to the right of it. And what's going to happen now is that Havage starts to make HTTP requests. So it's just making normal requests via the browser. Except it's not kind of normal. It's like requests with malformed things at the end to try and get the system to do things that it's not meant to do. Now, while it's doing this, it's getting the system to respond in unusual ways, and it's responding in ways that disclose internal information. And right down the bottom, it actually tells us the internal database name. This database is called hackyourselffirst underscore db. This is internal information. You shouldn't be able to discover this. All right, now what Jenna's going to do is we want to start getting tables out of the system. So she's going to hit that little tables button, and then there's a get tables button just underneath it. And now it's going to find all the tables that exist in the system. Here they come. This is all internal information. We're going to let that load. And most databases will have anywhere from half a dozen tables to many hundreds of tables. And this is probably the harder bit of the hacking, Jenna, because what you've got to do is decide what looks like the juiciest table in there that you want to get data out of. What about you guys? What, what would you choose out of these tables? User profile, the, the masses have spoken. Shall we get user profile? So we'll click the little checkbox next to user profile. Now let's get the columns out of that table. So there's another button there that says get columns. So now it's going through, it's making more requests, and it's actually querying the database schema, so how the database is structured, to come and spit all the data back out so that we know exactly what it looks like. Now what do we reckon would be juicy in there? What would we want to get out of the user profile table? Email and password? That sounds good. Do you want to get email and password? See, so, I mean, you can figure the rest of this out yourself. <laughs> this is how easy it is. Now, what are we going to do next? Oh, you, you, I saw you go straight to get data. You sure you haven't done this before? <laughs> <laughs> the, the correct answer is no. <laughs> All right. And here we go. So now what's going to happen is we're starting to get email addresses and passwords 
and Jenna has now hacked the system. So a big round of applause. Well done. <laughs> So that's, that's kind of scary because that's how simple it is and look I, uh, I hope that what I've been able to do is kind of sufficiently uh, scare and inspire people about security. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. I'm going to hang around a little bit as well so if anyone wants to ask questions please come and see me. Thanks guys.